Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt and I am the pastor of Dubuque Community Church and the title of today's message is Preparing Unlikely People. Although God has a wonderful plan for our good and he does have his almighty power to accomplish the work of his plan, he also performs his work through normal and many times unlikely people just like you and I. And that's one of my first scripture verses that's not on the screen is Romans 11:33 that says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Many times if we try to understand and figure out what's God up to, what's he doing, how is he going to get it done, uh, we, we probably will we'll probably miss the boat. Uh, we probably won't uh, get it right. And we're going to see today that God is going to be calling. And this is important to know that God, his call or his uh, assignment of work to each and every one of us for the work of his kingdom is often given to us. And when we get it in our own fleshly uh, strength, it would be impossible for us to complete that task. But with God's help, of course, uh, we will then be able to accomplish the task. And that's another verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen jars to show that the all-surpassing power is from God. Well, we're gonna talk about two people today, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and they couldn't have children and uh, we're going to see that God is going to use these two people that can't have a, a child to, to ha be the father and mother of John the Baptist. <clears throat> and you know, there's an often repeated cliche that says God doesn't choose the prepared. He prepares the chosen. So he, we're going to see how he has been preparing these people and see how he chosen them, chose them. God's work in men's lives is always carried out and executed because of God's great strength and not because our mere human efforts. We need to know that so we don't get discouraged. Today again, we're going to be reminded of one of God's great announcements of a coming great prophet uh, recorded in the Old Testament book of Malachi. If you were with me last time, you remember how we started clear back in Genesis and work through all the major prophetic events going right up to, uh, starting with Adam and Eve and going right up to the last Old Testament prophet called Malachi. And that's where we ended the last time. And we're going to start with that same scripture verse just to remind us what Malachi had said. And here we see on the screen there, it says, See, Malachi 4, 5, 6, and 8, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, what he's saying is I'm going to send, it will not be Elijah. It'll be someone with the same spirit of Elijah who preached that Israel needed to repent and return back into their walk with God. And we know now that he was speaking about John the Baptist who must come before the, the appearing of the Messiah. So this is who we're going to be talking about today, John the Baptist. We're going to look at everything all behind the, the, this, that information today. And, and as you, if you remember from Malachi, or this is Malachi, it says 6.8, it says, Then he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their father. A wonderful verse. It's all about spiritual renewal. And uh, when people repent and turn back to God, uh, God will give parents soft hearts toward their children. Their focus will go to their children instead of to this lost and fallen world. The children, they, their hearts will soften and their hearts will return back to their fathers. And uh, instead of listening to all their friends, and listening to this lost world as well, uh, all these wonderful gifts come when we get back with 
God. Well, if you remember, Malachi was written 400 years uh, before the New Testament came into being to, to the events that we're going to see in the book of Luke today. Uh, Luke was the writer of a New Testament gospel book. And uh, we're going to see that he's going to use, that God is going to use this very unlikely couple uh, to, to accomplish his supernatural will and to fulfill his plan. So here we are in Luke 1, 5, and it's talking about the when and the where. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias, and, uh, he, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. And we want to see all this today to see that we can see when and where King Herod was the, the Herod of the Bible that was there at the time of Jesus who ruled during then. And I guess the reason I want us to see this is that this is not a once upon a time story a far, far away. This is a true life experience with two people that we can see how God worked in these people's lives. Well, then it goes on to say both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. Well, one thing I can tell you is they were not perfect. There are no perfect human beings ever. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But uh, one requirement that we need to see, and this is true for all of us, is, is if we're thinking, you know, I wouldn't mind being able to do more for the kingdom of God, we need to make sure we're doing everything that we can right now to, to follow the word of God. Uh, you know, I'll use the word just. Just being faithful uh, made them great candidates for the, more, the greater work that God is about to get them. And you know, some people, maybe if they would have been observing them, they would have looked at them and said, you know, here's these two people, they're, they're doing everything right. Here they don't even have children and all that. And uh, wondering if they, and maybe even them, maybe Zacharias and Elizabeth might even said, well, we're not really doing anything great for the kingdom of God. Well, when you are being faithful to God, you are doing great things for God. Well, on the next verses, just uh, to save time uh, and to keep us moving, it tells us in verse 7 that, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. She was absolutely unable to have children, as we know in the natural sense. And yet God was about to give them this very important job. Looking from a worldly point of view, we might say, well, these two people would not be very good candidates to being the parents of, of uh, this coming uh, person who's going to go before the Lord. They're too old and they, they, uh, they have no experience raising children. How, how is this going to work? Well, we're going to see that it will work very well. So then we looked at Zechariah a little more as we're getting ready and kind of getting our foundation here. Uh, Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God. And while he was serving as priest before God, and there was a, quite a few different priests there, there was a wonderful blessing that people would get and they would throw lots, which is very similar to our modern day dice game. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was not gambling, it was just to who, so that God could direct who that person would be who would go up to the temple, inside the temple, and sacrifice incense on the altar to Almighty God. It was a great privilege. Well, uh, Zechariah, he, 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 he got the job, and he was going up to burn incense, and while he was inside burning incense, all the other worshipers, they're outside praying and everything. And everything looked kind of like it always did. But that's all going to change now. In verse 11, it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Wow! <laughs> that was not normal. 
for him to see an angel, a messenger of God. And I like this detail here. Notice it said that that angel was just even standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And I love detail. That tells me these are real life details. Well, it tells us in the next verse, when Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. And I can tell you, if you saw an angel, you'd be startled and you would be gripped with fear as well because angels live in the very presence of God. And when you see an angel, it's an, an amazing experience. So what does the angel say? The angel says something that the word of God tells each and every one of us every day and is a very important or every time we read it. And that's the thing is, do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. God wants us to know that if we are walking with him, we have nothing to be afraid of. He will be with us and see us through each thing. But then he said, your prayer has been heard. Well, the scripture didn't even record that he was praying, but we know, and I know, that he has been praying, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. But what I want to say here is, if you're praying and you don't see answers to your prayers, there's three things that God, how God always answers prayers. First of all, yes, and he might answer your prayer, but he might even answer it in a way you didn't even expect, even in a better way many times. Or he may say no, because it's not good for you. If he gave you what you're asking for, it would end up very terribly down the road. But the other one that he says, and this is a hard one, many a times it's wait. God will say wait because the time, his timing is better than ours. Could it be that Zachariah and his wife had not yet learned some kind of lesson that they were going to need to be great parents for John the Baptist? Uh, did they learn something while they were waiting? Uh, or was it just not yet time for the appearing of the forerunner, John the Baptist, for the coming Messiah to appear? But because of it, it says, your prayer has been heard, and uh, don't be afraid, your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. Well, God had already chosen his name. His name is going to mean Yahweh has been gracious. And then verse 14 says, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be a delight to you. You know what? This child is going to be a blessing to you. He's not going to be a rebel. And anybody that knows when you have children that kind of get away from God and they start following their own paths, it's kind of, there's a lot of heartache that comes for them and for you. So he's going to be a great delight to you. And he's also going to bless many because of his, uh, uh, because of his, uh, because of his birth. And then it goes on to say, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, for he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Well, he's going to be great. He's going to be doing great things for the Lord. And one of the things he's going to do, he's never going to drink wine or any fermented drink. And you know, the Word of God tells us that don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Boy, we have a choice there, and that, that's what made it easy for, easier for me some time ago to stop drinking. And there's nothing wrong with having a drink. But if you're getting drunk, don't expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a choice, and uh, ch choose to have the Holy Spirit and not to have so much of this earthly wine that's so much more inferior. But here's the, here's the important part. It says, He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. 
Now this is totally unusual. Nowhere else in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, including Jesus Christ himself, did it ever say that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. There were people like Samson and Gideon and other great people that would have the Spirit of God come upon them uh, for a short time. Or even the New Testament after Pentecost, when people, after they had accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they had been baptized, that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. But this, for, in this case, this child was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from, from birth. And then verse 16, it says, And many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. Well, he's not going to bring back a few. He's going to bring back many people to the Lord. And it's all going to be starting as he begins to talk about repentance. And repentance is a big word, but it just literally means to stop following your own flesh, to get away from your sinful old life, and to start living in alignment with the Word of God. That was his message. And then it goes on to say, And he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. I hope you say, hey, that's where we started in Malachi. That's, that's right there. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Remember we talked about that, how when there is a repentance, when a spiritual renewal Fathers will get uh, restored to their children and children of their father, and the disobedient of the uh, of, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Do you know when you're disobedient to the word of God, you are hurting yourself. You are hurting yourself and everybody around you. If you are wise, you want to live a godly life. And I can tell you, I've experienced both sides. And boy, living a godly life, that is where it's at. That's where the blessing is at. He wanted to restore them. He will restore them back to the wisdom of the righteous and away from the disobedience. And to make ready a people ready for the Lord. And he's, he's, he's going to be the way maker for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Zechariah had a question. The next verse asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. Well, they were both too old to have children, and in a worldly sense, it looked like it would be impossible for them to fulfill the angel's uh, command that they were going to have a son and to name him John. See, this is where God's mighty power comes in. Zachariah said, how can this be? Well, here we're going to see how it can be. The angel answered, I am Gabriel, which means God is my strength. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Well, uh, we believe that angel Gabriel actually stood right in the presence of Almighty God, as it says there, and I've been sent to speak to you. Angels never come because they decide to. You know, we're coming into the Christmas time of the year and there's stories about angels leaving heaven and they come and they just kind of do their own thing and they're trying to get people, or, you know, it's all a bunch, it's not the word of God. Angels are sent on very specific mess, uh, missions to, to reach people, but it's always by God. So I've been spent to, sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Well, I can tell you good news is where we get the word gospel, but uh, my wife and I, uh, many years ago, we were married for almost 12 years, and we had no children. And when I found out we were going to have a baby, I wept like a baby because I was so happy. Zachariah and Elizabeth probably had waited closer to 40 years and probably had given up all hope of ever having children and now they got these good news. So boy, that was good news. But now in verse 20, the angel tells them this, a little bit of a rebuke to Zechariah. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. I guess he's kind of saying, gee, 
Zechariah, you had an angel come from heaven. How much more evidence do you need that this is going to happen? And then he said it's all going to happen in God's all-knowing and perfect time. Well, while they're in there and they're talking away back and forth, the people are standing outside and normally the priest would go inside and he would put the incense on the altar and turn around, come right back out. Well, they're starting to say, what happened to that guy? What's he doing? They're wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. This is verse 21, not on the screen. And when he came out, of course, the, the uh, angel had told him, you're not going to be able to speak. So he couldn't speak. He couldn't tell him what was going on. And uh, so he kept making signs of them, but he was unable to speak. And then verse 23, not on the screen, tells us this. When the time of his service was completed, he returned home. And you know, again, this is very telling. This tells me of the faithfulness of this man. Uh, I think if I saw an angel and he told me my wife is going to have a baby and we've been waiting for 40 years, I think I'd want to head home right now. I can't speak. I can't do anything. I'd say, you know, I'd write on the tablet, hey boss, can I go home early? You know, I don't know. But he was so faithful. He fulfilled his time of service. And then we get back on the screen. And after this, of course, his wife Elizabeth became preg pregnant. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. Uh, and then after that, and by the way, people say, why would she do that? She was probably uh, so excited, uh, or probably fearful, somewhat in shock, almost afraid that it was true. And so that she was kind of waiting until she absolutely knew she had a baby in there and that baby's kicking and moving and she's, okay, I am going to have a baby. And then, and then in verse 25, it says this, and I love this, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Well, the one thing about when you wait 40 or 50 years to have a baby and an angel tells you you're going to have one, you absolutely totally understand this child is a gift from God. By the way, every child is a gift from God, but she really knew it and she was given praise to the Lord. She said, this, the Lord has done this for me. And you know, it says, in taking away my disgrace, we don't quite understand this today, but back in those days, if you did not have children, People thought that maybe you had some kind of secret sin in your life and God was punishing you by not letting you have children. So there was all kinds of people that could have easily misread what was going on with Zachariah and Elizabeth when God was just preparing them for this great work. Well, we're going to continue down through the story. And uh, in 57 through 66, not on the screen yet, but it says that Elizabeth had her baby. And she gave birth to a son. Oh, surprise, just the way God said to. Well, all the neighbors and relatives, they're all excited. You might understand uh, that, God, uh, that God heard and they heard that God had shown her such great mercy. Why? Because <laughs> Elizabeth was busy telling them, this is God. This is a blessing from God and how he had shown her great mercy. Well, then back on the screen on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zachariah. Well, on the eighth day, that was what the law said. Here they are. They're still being faithful. And they wanted to name him after his father, Zachariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is called John. You know, sometimes people are well-meaning and they're often trying to help but they might not be following the leading of the Lord. Elizabeth knew what uh, Zechariah had told her with, by writing it down on a, on a, on a tablet that, that the angel had said that his name was going to be John. And so she was doing it. And these people probably thought, well, you know, after waiting this long, there's probably only going to ever have one child. They should probably name him Zacharias. And then they said, well, the people here, they're continuing to grumble. There's no one among your relatives by that name. So they made signs to the father, you know, trying to get him to jump in on that. Let's call him this child Zacharias. And by the way, the fathers would cast the, 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 the defining vote there. And I love this again. He asked for a writing tablet. 
to, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. <laughs> he didn't say his name could be John, his name might be John. He knew that God had already given him the name John, and he said, his name is John. And I get a little emotional about that, but he was so sure that this was God working through him. And it's such a blessing when you really have a sense of God working through you. And he knew this gift, this child, was a gift from God. Well, something happened and in the next verse when he wrote his name is John. He said, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak praising God. Well, God gave him back his ability to speak and he used it very well. The first thing he did was begin to praise God for all that he had done for him. Well, it says then all the neighbors were in awe and all through the hill country, everybody's talking about this. And in verse 66 and out on the screen, it says, what is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So now we're going to look real quick to see what, what uh, Zacharias had to say. And here it is in here. And first of all, as I said, he gave all praise to the Lord, all praise to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. So he, remember we talked about that promised redeemer that's coming. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. So he's here for all those, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvations from, from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us. Praise the Lord. And uh, he's going to talk about him being a great prophet. And then he says, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the path of peace. God is the one who shines the light into our darkness, and uh, he's that light that we all need. And we're going to get back here to where uh, 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 here he is, Zechariah, right back where the angels started talking to him. And we, the title of the message was Preparing Unlikely People. And uh, God, down through the centuries, has used over and over again unlikely people you might feel like an unlikely candidate to do great work for the kingdom of God. You might even feel like you're just being faithful to the, lo to the Lord. And I would challenge you today to stop and think. Are you faithful to the Lord? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you gathering together with other believers? If you are, then, God, then you're ready for God to call you to something even greater for His service and for His kingdom. God bless you. Amen.